Today we're joined by Dr. Betsy Harold uh, from the Department of Pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Um, Betsy, thanks for joining us. We've been hearing recently about some really serious uh, manifestations of COVID-19 in young people, and you and your colleagues uh, looked at one month period and described children and adolescents who came into the emergency room um, and had a, a, a positive coronavirus test. What did you find among these young people? So th that study, which was recently published in the journal Pediatrics, is really a very early description of COVID in children and adolescents. Um, and I think that's, um, that those experiences are quite distinct from what we're now seeing. Oh. So at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, which is in the Bronx, which is one of the big epicenters of COVID-19 infections, we've admitted to the hospital over 100 children with various forms of COVID-19 disease. Now that likely is a very small proportion of the total number of children who are infected because we're only testing and admitting patients who are very ill. Mm -hmm. But it is important to remember that that's a tiny percentage um, of the total number of adults that were admitted to the same institution over the same time period. So the first point to reiterate is that um, this disease does cause less significant um, illness overall in children compared to adults. So parents should be reassured about that. That's kind of like a baseline. So in that early descriptive study, which was led by some colleagues of mine in the intensive care unit, they just wanted to describe the early experiences of the children who got sick enough to be admitted to the intensive care unit. And that first group, which was really a small number of children, really resembled the adults. So those are children who, um, and they were more of the adolescent age group for the most part, um, who developed uh, pulmonary disease, um, the respiratory distress syndrome that's described in the adults um, that was very similar to the adult phenotype. And so I think the, the major point of that early article is, yes, children can get the same kind of symptomatology, ARDS spectrum that we were seeing in adults. That was one of my questions, actually, because I wonder if you're seeing some different manifestations in children versus adults, because we know that in adults, that severe disease is associated with the severe inflammation and all these elevated uh, levels of immune inflammatory signals. And was that the same thing that you saw in those children? And is that something else again than what we're seeing in this this more recent thing that people are right. talking about? This Kawasaki-like disease. So, if I can take it a step back, I think there's a there's a broad spectrum of what we're seeing in the children. So, the least sick children we're seeing are very young children who come in maybe just with fever as a baby. Um, they, they would normally have gotten admitted pre-COVID for the reasons that in a baby has fever, um, particularly fever for more than a day, you're worried about a serious bacterial infection or a serious viral infection. And you would bring them into the hospital, obtain blood cultures, obtain other testing, start them on antibiotics, make sure that there's nothing serious going on. So early in this epidemic, we were seeing that, and those babies were having uh, bacterial blood cultures that were negative, but lo and behold, were positive for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Those babies all did well. So it can be as simple as, you know, sort of a transient fever kind of illness in the younger kids. We also saw a series of children who presented with predominantly abdominal features, and I think that's a little bit more common in the children than that is in the adults. So some of them came in as a rule-out appendicitis, they had abdominal pain, they might have had some vomiting or diarrhea. They again tested COVID-19 positive using the PCR test. And in general, those children also did very well. And then in the first sort of month of our seeing a lot of COVID-19 children, we saw a fair number who did develop some respiratory symptoms, relatively mild, never needed admission to the ICU. And then this very small subset of children that got admitted to the intensive care unit that developed a disease that was similar to the adults, with more severe respiratory distress syndrome, a few of them, but very few requiring mechanical ventilation. Now what we're seeing in sort of the month two to three of COVID is this new syndrome that you're referring to. Um, so this new syndrome again presents in many different ways. So nothing is simple with this virus. Um, and so what we're seeing though is some of these children, and I think this is what's very intriguing to us, are not presenting with respiratory disease. And actually when you look, already have antibodies to the virus. So this is 
resembling sort of that cytokine storm that you mentioned um, that we're seeing in the, the adult and some of the adolescent patients and some of the kids. So in that sort of classic COVID description, and I like the way we're using classic for a disease that's been around less than six months, but in the <laughs> classic description, you would have sort of mild to moderate pulmonary disease. There'd be like this two week period. And then suddenly some small subset of those patients would get acutely worse. They might develop high fevers all of a sudden. Their respiratory disease might get worse. They might actually develop uh, multi-system organ failure, so renal failure, cardiac involvement. And when you measured in their blood, their acute phase reactants, their inflammatory markers, they would be markedly elevated. And that typically was linked to the ARDS syndrome. In the kids, what we're seeing is uh, somewhat similar kinetics, but you're almost missing that first phase. So they don't have much in the way of pulmonary disease, and they're not even coming in, and they don't even know that they have COVID. And then all of a sudden, what we base, you know, based on their history and exposures maybe to a parent or someone else who actually did have COVID disease, they're coming in four weeks or even a little bit longer post what we think would have been a relatively asymptomatic COVID right. period. And now they're coming in with this inflammatory response, which could look a little bit like Kawasaki disease, could involve cardiac involvement, you know, with myocarditis or cardiomyopathy, or this full-blown uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome of children, which has been changing its name every week. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wanted to ask you that in particular because the you know everything is changing really fast. But the way I understand it, these these kids who are experiencing these really severe outcomes appear to be having those manifestations, you know, weeks after they've probably already cleared the virus. And I don't know if you have any understanding of what mechanism would bring that about. Why would that happen? So that you, you've asked the million dollar question and we like probably hundreds of other labs in the country are busy studying this. And I think, you know, one of the most concerning things is that they are for the most part, antibody positive already, yeah. which, is a little bit disconcerting because that's suggesting that for this part of the disease, the antibodies certainly are not protective. Doesn't mean the antibodies- but Do they have still have the virus? Can you can test whether they do. have the oh, okay. So some of them are PCR positive and some of them are PCR negative. Mm. Um, but a good percentage of them, well over half at least at our institution, are antibody positive. Yeah. So that's suggesting, and that's also true in the adults who have ARDS, many of them are already antibody positive. So it may be that once you've had the, the exposure to the virus, that in some subset of patients, um, and we don't know why, you're getting this inflammatory response late in the disease that in the adults more often manifests as ARDS, but in the kids is more often manifesting as this MISC or this multi-inflammatory syndrome complex. And so I have another one of those million dollar questions. Do we know in advance which are the kids who are going to do well versus poorly? So that's the research we're, we're actually doing. Um, uh, we've been running some assays with colleagues, looking at antibody responses, the targets of those antibodies, T cell responses, cytokines, et cetera, to really try to get a handle on what you're asking. Is there some lab test or some demographic or some genetic or some marker that we can be able to predict who's going to get into trouble? And then can we intervene to prevent yeah. the patient who's going to get into trouble from getting into trouble? Um, In the meantime, we're not going to have those answers next week. So meanwhile, if we can't tell who is going to do well and who isn't, what do you say to parents right now who are thinking about whether to send their kids to school or daycare, for example? Yeah. So that's a really difficult question. Um, and, we, you know, obviously we're all trying to balance um, caution with reality with what's you know what's best for children what's best for everyone so you know I, I think there needs to be some reassurance that this is a small percentage of the total population that's getting this illness that we don't know the risk factors i think one of the other things that's very potentially peculiar about the epidemiology here and again we don't have enough data um, is it does appear that for the most part many of these children that are coming in a parent or a grandparent or someone in the home um, that had COVID. And so it seems like the parents, the, the kids are not necessarily the, 
the driver of in, infecting the adults, which is more typical for a lot of respiratory viruses, right? We think about the kids bring the viruses home from daycare and from school and the mom and dad get sick. This time it seems like the mom and dad or grandparent or aunt or uncle or whomever is the initial infected person. The kids aren't getting all that sick mm. and then they're potentially developing this late sequelae. Mm. So I think parents can be somewhat reassured that we don't think for the most part the kids are the super spreaders, which was originally a concern, mm. but I can't say that kids can't be a super spreader. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, some of the, we all read the same things on the news and, you know, seen the images from places like Denmark where, you know, they're making an effort to, yes, bring the kids back into the programming, but it's staggered schedules. So the class sizes are small. There are, there's a nice picture of the kids lining up six feet apart, but mm. washing and washing their hands every two hours. Oh, wow. um, there is a picture of them, you know, on the playground and there's little circles on the ground and each kid is, you know, doing whatever the exercise of that moment is, but they're all six feet apart. Mm. I think we can do these kinds of things and I think we need to do these kinds of things and safely balance, you know, letting children be back into situations where they are interacting with their peers, um, but doing it in a safe way. So um, to bring it back to all the lots of questions uh, that still need to be answered, and we know that you're on the case, but I mean, you're, you're a person who normally researches HIV and, and another virus, herpes simplex virus, and its effect on the risk for acquiring HIV, for example. So you obviously have a long history of doing viral research. Do you think that has helped or what kind of lessons have transferred over to studying this new virus versus which ones haven't? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, so the most recent work that our lab's been engaged in, as you probably know, is development of a vaccine for herpes simplex virus. We immediately kind of jumped at this um, COVID question thinking, well, wait a second, we've got two concerns here. One is we need to identify the immune response that's going to be helpful. So when we started this, and I actually was doing this with my husband, who's a T-cell immunologist at Yale, and since we're both doing a lot of e-consults from home and doing a lot of running our labs from home, uh, dinner conversation has been very COVID-centric. Oh, wow. Our question is, we now have four cohorts. We have the kids who do well, the kids who develop this novel syndrome, the adults who well, and the adults who do poorly. And by teasing that apart, we can begin to ask these questions. So one concern, I mentioned that the antibodies are already present in the patients who have the ARDS, and, and in the patients who are ventilated, as well as in these children who have this MISC syndrome. And so one concern is, are the antibodies potentially harmful? We don't have any direct data for that, so I don't want anyone to take that home as yes, but it's something that we need to ask. Or is there some subset of antibodies that's protective, and what are the mechanisms? So these are the questions we need to ask, but we are absolutely using all the tools that we've learned from our vaccine work, and the studies we're doing on sort of why HSV makes HIV worse, the HIV HSV syndemic, again, is a study that I've been doing collaboratively with my husband at Yale and some of his colleagues at Yale, kind of combining our immunologic abilities. So it's led, led, led us to kind of ask some really good questions and you know, continue some of the collaborations we've already started. Hmm. Great. Well, it sounds like you're going to be busy for a long time yet. Yeah, uh, I think thanks. most of us would hope it would go away and that yeah. everybody could go back to quote unquote yeah. life as we knew it, but that's not highly likely. Right. Well, thanks a lot for uh, spending time today and going through all of these issues that I know a lot of people are really interested in. Thanks. All right. Thanks for having me.